Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramp. As you can see, I changed my background yet again. If you take a quick look back here, this was kind of like a nice little stump that I took a picture of next to the library that uh, really kind of uh, uh, budded a whole bunch of mushrooms just off the stump. So I thought that was a pretty cool shot for sure because we've been dealing with some uh, interesting weather patterns with some uh, precipitation and rain and stuff for the last couple weeks or so. Uh, of course, you know, this week, uh, things are starting to really cool down over the, the week and the week weekends. Uh, temperatures in the high uh, uh, 60s are upon us coming next week. I also have another announcement is that MCAT does indeed plan on utilizing uh, the, uh, well, going back to the old school ways of uh, the homecoming parade. So on uh, September, I want to say, yep, September 30th, uh, the UM Homecoming Parade is happening downtown in the normal way as it normally happens. Last year, the Bear Track Bridge prevented uh, many people from using it, so we started off next to uh, Sentinel High School off South Avenue. This time around, we're going to be got back to uh, starting at the Red X's and at, uh, parade routes. We're going to be working down there as well. I believe there is uh, ample time for a lot of organizations, nonprofits, and uh, commercial enterprises to uh, join the uh, parade that is going to be coming on September 30th. And again, it'll start as always at 10 a.m. It seems like most parades in Missoula starts around 10 a.m. It's not too early. It's not quite too late for uh, some folks as well. But we're going to jump right into some of the top news items that are going on right now. Just happening last night, as of Thursday night, around 11 59 p.m. The contracts for 146 uh, U, uh, United, uh, United Auto Workers Union Workers Sunset and with talks of more than a 40% raise across the board for all workers in conjunction with the owners who saw record profits in the billions over the last couple of months alone. So the companies uh, collectively posted a net income of $164 billion over the past decade, 20 billion of just this year. Ford Motor Company, for example, were the first companies to create a strong union to have set hours, wages, and benefits for their employees, which galvanized the times to have strong unions in the post-World War II era. It created the 40-hour work week and the concept of the weekend. Not to mention the changing times that we live in today and the world economy which really took root in the 90s when the EU and North America created pathways for international trade. Hence, outsourcing became the norm. Why pay an employee when you can pay less an hour? Uh, another country where the U.S. dollar goes further in a foreign market than ever could in the United States. So the union has about $825 million set aside for a strike fund that they've been saving up. And uh, essentially, uh, with the uh, over 100,000 workers that they have there, they uh, this would probably run dry in just under three months of striking and protesting. And so far, Ohio, Michigan, and Missouri are the first locations to go on strike with over 13,000 employees. And according to the UAW president, Sean Fain, strike locations will be targeted to make massive impact on the auto industry with the big three auto companies employees, which are under the umbrella of the UAW union, which covers a wider range of unions than just the one company union. And for many workers, their jobs of of the future are at stake because of the impact of electric vehicles paving the future of the auto industry. Uh, East Missoula is also looking to update their highway connection from their community creating an East Missoula corridor. Uh, so far there is a uh, narrow road, there's not much there, but they're trying to improve it to expand it so they can have bike lanes, uh, basic sidewalks, boulevards, that kind of stuff. And since uh, it is road construction, Missoula, a roundabout is also being considered too uh, from the highway. If you're going to East Missoula, we'll have more on this during my city council report. While we have construction and projects on down the pipeline, the Human Homeless Project just seems to not be working here in Missoula. As we spoke about the horror stories of vouchers and property management in Missoula from my past city council report, there is a real uptuck in housing vouchers, which means longer waiting lists. Veteran Affairs in Missoula is a short staffed according to the Missoula Current that is housing veterans and has become difficult. VA has better housing options for folks more than the vouchers on civilians, mind you. Uh, the Missoula Current goes into de detail about this. Uh, and it was given out 374 vouchers given uh, out to the state. 143 haven't been used in 2023, up from 118 from 2022 and 90 from 2021. Uh, even worse is that the Section 811 uh, housing with more than 70% of vouchers for disabled Montanans under 62 years of, uh, of age were unused. So the short staffing and waiting lists get longer every day and we see the issues stack on top of further and further 
and you know, if we even dive a little bit deeper, it's like if you want to make some real change, you have to invest the money behind it. And the homelessness issue in, uh, in Missoula is simply the population boom during the pandemic, which saw a series of folks being priced out of their homes in bigger cities, downsized into places like Missoula, thus pushing up prices of demand and uh, supply, with, which being strained. Uh, those who have housing had to deal with those same higher prices in conjunction with the new people. The new people are a symptom of their issues in the bigger city and homeless, which contrary to popular belief are more so locals dealing with the with a common problem with the non renewal of lease. So instead of being evicted, they will continue your lease until your lease is up and they won't even do a new contract. I've heard this many times before. Renters I've known have cannot pay their rent when their landlord decides to update their building and more tenants have higher costs associated with the demand that the standard of living changed. The vouchers, which have been used to help veterans, disabled adults under the age of 62 and civilians who qualify, turns out uh, after the 120 day period, there's not much more these vouchers can do after those days. What seems to be happening is the increase of renter class versus the owner class as governing bodies contributing to the public housing on a scale that seems like state controlled housing to control the pricing, but take away the ability uh, to get out of poverty because once you make a certain amount of money, you'd lose the affordable housing parameters that were created to keep people at a certain area of income in those types of homes. So hence, we get a workforce housing as an alternative, which we look further back into the 1890s, 1920s, before that. Um, it kind of reminds me of the concept of Hoovervilles, which was created after the collapse of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, stock market cracks collapsed in the 1920s and they were basically created as a kind of like a housing option for folks and you know uh, Herbert Hoover the president at the time was very criticized for that um, so essentially uh, uh, as we go back even further you know like oh, not, not go back but we go back to modern days an average house in the Missoula is roughly five hundred and twenty nine thousand dollar mortgage with a seven point four three interest rate for a fixed 30 year loan the wage earner would have to make roughly 172000 a year just to be considered middle class. What's even worse is the markets we live in, uh, it was in fact that um, one of the big things that is the Wall Street's getting a little bit more involved with housing and a lot of the signs of the times and there's uh, people like uh, big investor Warren Buffett, the Wall Street guy, made a, big, a bet against Wall Street to fail in general with Michael Burry, who uh, called the housing collapse of 2009. So if you don't know who Michael Burry is, he's kind of like the uh, first guy to call out the uh, housing market, which was about to collapse. A lot of banks were wrapping this up. There's a lot of uh, bets for because nobody believed that the housing market would collapse. And so there's a lot of investment, a lot of things put behind it. It was very stacked and it was basically set up to fail. Um, and Barry also became known after the movie The Big Short, which explained the housing crisis of 2009. As best uh, they can say, us, us foreign normies who have no idea what's going on. Um, so the bet is going to be into the Dow Jones and the uh, S&P. Uh, so when Wall Street starts getting involved in housing, we should also take note. So let's uh, let's see here. I'm going to kind of move on. I'm going to take off my uh, tinfoil hat. There's just a lot of weird things going on for sure. But it looks like there's a new location for both city and county governments. will be much cheaper to open. Uh, the historic Missoula Post Office in downtown Missoula was acquired by the city and county in a joint assessment easement in a district created by both city and county to avoid a legal tug of war between ownership of the building overall through federal grants and some of the ARPA money, $2.5 million total budget, $1 million from the federal dollars and split between both city and county with an annual opening operating uh, budget of a $119,000 a year. And to put it in perspective, MCAP roughly paid 65, 85, uh, no, 65 to uh, 68,000 a year on rent on our old space in the downtown of the old Missoula building at 500 North Higgins. Um, most of the money will be going towards updating and opening the building for government operations while the post office will continue operations from the Broadway facing entrance. And of course, I've spoken about this during my city council report and having presentations on using this space to combine offices and not needing to build a whole new building to accommodate the space needed for a growing gov government in contrast with our growing population. And speaking of government, this is probably some of the things I probably sort of kicked things off with the news, but I'm sure you probably already know about it because as of Wednesday with the majority of 9,000 votes over Nugent. Andrea Davis and Mike Nugent will be taking the two top spots for the mayorship, which the election will be happening 
on November 5th, which is a Tuesday. And I mean, I don't want to get political, but I'm pretty sure the uh, mayor of Missoula will be a Democrat. However, this will only cover the rest of Mayor John Ingen's term for two years before the normal 2025 election. For those who don't know, Missoula lost the mayor in August uh, 2021 to cancer. 17 years as mayor as long as a long run for any office and seen three elections within a span of three years to appeal to state law and mandates on local elections. So in other words, um, this is going to be an interesting election. We're guaranteed to have somebody new. Uh, current Mayor Jordan Hess uh, uh, didn't get the, uh, the bump from being an incumbent for filling in for the spot when he won the uh, election from council uh, last year. So for Ward 5, uh, there was more than enough uh, interested parties to uh, uh, be a part of Ward 5. And so those to two top two contenders will be Linwood Fields and Bob Campbell, former retired police officer, will be going head to head after taking their two spots for November. All Ward interviews are available on MCAT's YouTube page, MCAT TV Missoula. And you can also watch the mayoral, mayoral panel by also looking up for those items. So our YouTube page, MCAT TV Missoula, also has a little search bar. It allows you to look at past programs and more. While some things change, even more changes happening between local businesses closing their doors. So this is kind of, uh, you know, kind of goes in contrast with homelessness, rents going up and all that kind of stuff. Sawadee closed last week. The popular Asian restaurant closed their doors, but will continue to operate as their food stand and various venues across Missoula. Frankly, I would like Missoula to have a weekly food truck collaboration besides their time sensitive markets and summer events. Other restaurants are also closing the doors from the Catalyst, a bunch uh, popular brunch place, so popular that the sidewalks took over a good chunk of their seating. Uh, they'll uh, re not renew their lease. I'm sure you've heard that before. Burn Street Bistro is the latest to close their doors, and October will see the end since they opened their doors over a decade ago. Many businesses were uh, able to last through the pandemic only to deal with rising costs like and expensive rent and taxes associated with the times that we live in. Of course, I did spoke, uh, oh, I keep uh, okay, you can probably, uh, every time I say of course, I'm trying not to say of course a million, million times, but I always say it, but um, I did speak with some of the folks at the Empanada Joint as they were closing the doors. Uh, they didn't have much to say about why, except that they were ready to move on from the food business, so. Um, up next, we got some promos uh, for our Saturday drop-ins and more, uh, followed by our, another segment, Pre-Critic, before I jump into City Council. MCAT's kid-centric activity is back with Saturday drop-ins starting September 2nd. This weekly creative experience lets kids use stop animation to breathe life into their Legos and more. They're only limited by their imagination, and here at MCAT we promote creativity for kids aged 8 to 14. Ah! Join us inside Missoula Public Library every Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. Hey guys, welcome back. We're going to be talking a little bit about some movies that are coming out this week. And kicking things off is a third movie of a series of movies based on a series of books. Uh, Hercule Poirot comes back yet again to do a Scooby-Doo and the chamber of uh, just crazy things happening. A haunting in Venice. Um, Watch as the murder on the Ernie Express guy goes full Scooby-Doo in this murder mystery, but also ghosts. Watch as the person who uh, was the spiritualist convince everyone that she's magic or whatever, only to be 
um, actualized by the Hercule Poirot. I assume the spiritualist is also tricked into thinking that she actually might be special, only to be tricked by the killer themselves, uh, as that con conned themselves to be forced, and that caused the family connection to lose something because, uh, you know, big bad voodoo lady or something like that. Uh, that's usually the case when it comes to those kind of things where, like, you know, spoiler alert, you know, to a really old, old movie, Murder on the Orient Express, basically everyone was the murderer because the person kind of like, uh, screwed them all over. And so that's, that kind of feels like it's the theme for, of most of those kind of things. Then we got one of those kind of, uh, in a series of black exploitation type films that are, uh, have the idea of taking their power back comes a parody of old westerns in the form of a 1960s grindhouse type camp and modern modern commentary on modern life from the perspective of an outlaw taking vengeance on those who took an original plot. I better watch the, what I say because I might get the backhand of justice from Johnny Black, who must save a town from a rich land baron. Uh, and then we got a couple other movies. Camp Hideout, watch a home alone type of shenanigans during a summer camp as a bad kid learns to use his bad kid attitudes for good uh, uh, for, for the camp and make friends along the way. And they also have like your typical, you know, two uh, crook villains hiding out there. We have this other movie called The Inventor based on the life of, um, uh, God, I just forgot of it. Um, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, this movie is kind of working, has a lot of good vibes, basically saying from the creators of Ratatouille. I'm like watching the trailer, I'm just like, what, what, like somebody who PA'd for Ratatouille? But like, it feels like it must have been made by a guy who interned for the movie, making this kind of like Rankin and Bass, uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, looking uh, monstrosity that is the inventor. I'm sure the story is fine and kind of kid-friendly. Uh, then we got my last best friend, Julia Roberts' brother, Eric, tries to do an Oscar film where he plays opposite of himself in this movie that reminds us that COVID-19 is still a thing and people stuck indoors are people too. Uh, anyways, that's the movie that's are coming out this uh, this way, and I have a brand new dub and stuff where I redubbed a movie from the 1938 film um, or short, uh, Bulldog. Uh, wait, wait, hold on. It's a uh, Bulldog Drummond in Africa. So. Interesting uh, title, but it's from a, probably one of those old serials from way back in the day where they had a series of different things happening. Without further ado, here's this, and when I come back, we're going to talk deep dive into your city council. All right, all right. Everybody slow down. Do you realize how fast you are going in the oh, sky? Oh, great. It's the sky police. Oh. Can't you just leave us alone for how five dare seconds? You? And for crying out loud, I can't just pull over up in the sky. I have to land on the landing strip. Do you realize how fast you are going? Well, yeah, clearly over 200 miles per hour. Only commercial planes can fly faster than 150 miles per hour in well, the sky. Well, um, maybe I can sell you some. You would like, uh, uh, Laffy Taffy. Banana flavored. It's really good and delicious. Uh, <clears throat> huh, maybe something sweet. Oh, well, I do like saltwater taffy. Oh, could you put it on the list? Uh, cotton candy saltwater taffy, please. And tell them to hold the salt. And the water. <laughs> I don't think that's how it works, sir. Oh, uh, just make it happen. You see what I have to deal with? All right. Big way. I'm a spiritual medium. I'm going to check if this plane is haunted. Hmm. So, you like, uh... Uh, please excuse me. Um, so, when are we going to uh, get hold this on, on there. Perhaps we could show them the treasure. Oh, you mean the treasure? It's actually pronounced the treasure because of the con Con science? Well, let me tell you an example. So if you say apple, it's the apple, not the. Oh. Oh, oh it sounds right, so it must be right. Let me go tell the officer. Hey, uh, were you going to tell me something? Well, oh. aren't you Mr. Smarty Smart Smart Pants Smart? I went smart. to performing arts school. You. I went to a performing arts school, too, but I was making costumes. God bless. So it was pretty much like... Slave labor, you know, just like working and getting credit. Well, I don't know what that's like because I was a performer and we're the cool kids of the drum department. But you're the backbone. You are the most important part. Don't ever forget that. Our Achilles heel is compliments. So, uh, keep going. Uh, how about a kiss? <laughs> I've never dated an actor. Well, she's in for a rude awakening, that's for sure. Would you like some Laffa Taffy? I must it's... decline. My wife would take the Oh, well, that's unfortunate. Wait, what did you just say? Taffy murdered her father. Well, I want to say that uh, one bite wouldn't hurt. Hmm. <clears throat> well, there you go. I suppose it's just one bite after all. <laughs> Good boy. Well, we probably uh, shouldn't smoke next to the fuselage. 
So, let's go over here. Oh man, all this taffy, it's so heavy over here. Hey, some help? can somebody help? We got a lot of taffy. Ooh, all right, uh, let me take a look at it. Oh, come on. Oh yeah, there's a lot of taffy in here. Let me help. Mm -hmm. I, I oh, want no. the taffy. Oh no, 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 don't worry. Sorry about that. No, come on. Let's uh, Guys, pull this you're right. taffy out. so much taffy. Mm -hmm. I'm sure oh, our man. officer will be more than Banana. pleasantly surprised by the amount of taffy that we have back here. I know when I'm being ignored. Well, listen, you shouldn't go in there. There's a lot of taffy in there. Don't tell me how to do my job. I got this. All right, it's your taffy now. Come on. Hoo -ah. All right, close it. Wait a minute, there's no taffy in here. Hey guys, we're back. We're going to talk about some things happening within your city of Missoula. Kicking things off, we had a less than one hour meeting coming out of the Labor Day weekend as we jump back into the past with former council member and current Montana legislature, uh, Marilyn Marler, who uh, with public comment talks about the uh, University of Montana's property at Fort Missoula and talking a little bit more about how much of the university impacts uh, the use of Fort Missoula in general. So this is what she had to say. Most of the UM land is unsigned and it's managed for research, education, and conservation. I'm bringing you this map because Fort Missoula is large and the land ownership is really quite complicated. It's not evident when you're out at the site. I want you to notice that the map has two legends. The one on the right shows the landowners, which there are many. And the second one in the left-hand corner shows some features on UM land. Um, all of the green on this map is UM land. You'll see that UM is one of the major landowners at Fort Missoula. Um, not everybody knows that. Let's only look at the UM land, the green areas real quick, and I'll point out a few, but not all of the features, just out of respect for everyone's time tonight. Starting with number one, that's an open space area that we hope to manage collaboratively with City Parks and Rec as an open space. Now that the old JTL Knife River ponds are part of the city park system. Number two, more to the east is the location of some sweat lodges that have been in place for decades. Currently that partnership is managed with All Nations Health Center. Number three is the native plant garden at Fort Missoula, which is a collaboration with the Montana Natural History Center. Um, I'm gonna skip over four and five in the interest of time. Number six shows um, an important site in the history of the World War II concentration camp era at Fort Missoula. Um, it is signed in collaboration with the his uh, Fort Missoula History Museum. Um, I encourage everybody to go out and visit the fort soon, like in the next couple weeks. The weather is beautiful. Please take this map with you because it really is confusing. There's a lot going on out there. It's easy to get turned around, and this map will help you a lot. Um, it has helped me many times. All right, let's uh, – hold on. i got to get to my notes. All right. Um, so, of course, you know, the university uh, owns large areas near and around the Fort Missoula area. Typically, the future Farmers of America 4-H and Big Sky High School utilize these areas for school, sports, and activities. Um, you know, and, you know, speaking further into Fort Missoula, Ross Best gives comment on the ongoing development of Fort Missoula, specifically on the permits involving the privately owned uh, hospital uh, on the Fort Missoula property. Property. October 2nd, the City Council will consider two appeals regarding a proposed development at the old Fort Missoula Hospital property. I'm here tonight to object to the current procedures for the appeals because they don't allow members of the general public adequate opportunity to study and understand the appeals. My comments tonight apply only to the procedures to be followed, not to the ultimate merits of the development or the appeals. The Historic Preservation Commission voted on May 3rd to deny two historic preservation permits that had been requested by the developer. On June 1st, the developer filed notice of appeals of the votes denying the two permits. The June 1st appeal letter identified several grounds for appeal, but only very briefly and mostly in general terms. The letter provided inadequate facts to allow the public to prepare informed comments on the appeals. It also failed to provide in reasonable detail the legal grounds for the appeals. For example, 
The letter alleged the possibility of conflicts of interest involving members of the Historic Preservation Commission, but did not actually claim such conflicts existed, provide any evidence of conflicts of interest or relevant legal analysis, or even name any members of the commission who might have had conflicts of interest. The general public is left in the dark so far about the details. All right, so that's uh, that was Ross Best talking a little bit more about that information. Um, if you if we dive a little bit deeper to the Historic Preservation is an advisory committee and the city has final say on the matter, which will be up for public discussion on October second on Monday's meeting. I mean, of course, I spoke about this from a couple months back, and there were a lot of people who spoke ag against the property and their attempt to flip and exchange uh, and expand into residential, even though there uh, there are no residentials on the Fort Missoula property as a whole. The fact that the hospital on Fort Missoula is privately property is some kind of weird loophole when the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, so, th Okay, I, I'm getting off topic. Like, I, I wrote something there that doesn't make any sense if I say it out loud. So, the it, so if we give a little bit more background, the the owners who bought the uh, old uh, hospital on the property um, <coughs> wanted to basically essentially flip it, turn it into kind of like a business mixer kind of kind of thing. There's other businesses that kind of uh, rent out of the Fort Missoula areas. You know, like kind of like what Ross Best was saying is that the Indian Health, uh, I mean, Indian Center, one of those places. Uh, uh, um, I don't know if it's currently there right now, so I can't really, I'm kind of speaking off the cuff right now. So in many respects, um, the whole idea is that there's not much residential in that particular area in general, and it's mostly used for public access for a lot of people to utilize and look at the old historic museum at Fort Missoula, the military museum, uh, other various uh, buildings that are part of Missoula's history. And uh, there isn't, like, the th I think this is like a lot of people who are against this want to keep this as a more of a public kind of like it's like an extremely large park in 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 that respect in a lot of ways. So um, that's kind of like where where they're at right now. You know, the city of Missoula has a little bit more power in what they say moving forward. And I don't want to go too deep into uh, the historic preservation's involvement with a lot of past things that have happened over the last couple of years and its uh, current status, which is advised against any kind of uh, updated property of this site as well. Uh, so it's interesting, and this is going to talk about this further on October 2nd. Um, yeah, so anyways. Um, during this is this was also all during public comment, and we're going to continue to talk about this because this is going to kind of springboard me into our next topic, which goes into affordable housing, the authorized campsite, <coughs> and most of all, the residents who live near and around the Johnson Street Shelter. And uh, Montana Glass owner uh, Brian Dernberger uh, talks about uh, some of the things he's had to deal with just from uh, some of the uh, homeless folks that. Um, have a tendency to be around his uh, property at late nights. So this is uh, this is him. Reporting pictures on a daily basis of corner parties right in front of our business that happened every day. After lunch, groups gather, pass the bottle, joint, pipe, and after several hours, they start passing out, getting into fights, etc. The purpose of my complaint is I do not wish the council to enable this behavior in all six wards. The council's decision, votes, actions, and directions is currently enabling the homeless to grow here in my hometown of Missoula, Montana. The city enables this with free meals, porta potties, clothing, tents, and other amenities. Establishing work camps would enable them to continue to grow in numbers here in Missoula. If our neighborhood, in our neighborhood, there are no enforceable laws. Disturbing the peace, open containers, public drinking, public nuisance, and littering all cannot be cited to these individuals as they don't show up to the courts. If they do go to jail, which is full, they are typically released the next day and we see them right back at these corner parties. Okay, and to kind of uh, um, uh, talk a little bit more about this as well in terms of like the uh, revolving door within the uh, Missoula County uh, Detention Center, Missoula Sheriff uh, Jeremiah Peterson spoke about the capacity at the jail from the uh, Bonner Community uh, Council that I shot on Monday night. So here is the uh, uh, the sheriff of Missoula County. Just as a trend, uh, within the last two or three years that I've been at the sheriff's office, we are certainly seeing a rise in, in the more serious crimes within the county. 
Uh, I don't know if you're aware or not, but essentially our jail is pretty much a felony jail anymore. Uh, we have 396 beds uh, on Mullen Road, and we are full most of the time. Um, I didn't check today to see what our numbers were, but the last time I checked was on Thursday, and we were actually uh, seven people over uh, capacity, and so we had seven people sleeping on the floor. And, and like I already said, uh, we do hold some misdemeanors, but it's uh, only violent uh, misdemeanors, and then the rest are felonies. And, and that trend has has gone up since COVID, really, um, where we stopped housing a lot of those uh, misdemeanor offenses. All right. And so there's a little bit of a perspective uh, from the uh, county police department. Um, a couple of homeless folk who spoke earlier at these meetings talked about the problematic folks who are not being arrested and dealing with them on a daily basis and watching criminal activity be ignored. Dana Colino, City Council, spoke about these lack of affordable living in Missoula during uh, comments as well. I do have a proposal coming up on Wednesday to help increase the minimum allocation from the general fund towards the affordable housing trust fund each year from $100,000 up to $300,000. And I I'm open to any questions over the next few days if anybody wants to reach out or, or talk about it. Um, but I know right now we have our market rate housing trust fund or luxury housing trust fund um, through the Missoula Redevelopment Agency where we're giving out hundreds of thousands of dollars or over a million dollars a year towards redevelopments of market rate housing in Missoula. While we have over three million dollars of requests for affordable housing in Missoula that we just don't have the money to fulfill. Um, so I hope we can... Um, work to you know put more money in our budget towards affordable housing in missoula and perhaps put less towards luxury housing if we need to take money from somewhere else but um not funding these affordable housing requests is is simply hurting our community and is digging us deeper into this hole of people not being able to afford here and having to move out okay and so that was uh the uh, ending comment for uh the regular city council on Monday as we're going to start diving into um, essentially the, uh, let's see, uh, housing, um, sorry, hold on a second, housing redevelopment and community, which dove into many things, which included the, um, uh, which included the, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm losing track. So let's jump right in. The trust fund is used as a tool to create as much sustain, uh, sustained, uh, sub, subsidized affordable housing with the all the buzzwords to make you feel better, but frankly only as a drop in the pan when it comes to the government sponsored housing initiatives that have uh, restrictions on them with the uh, 60 to 80 percent uh, average median income. <laughs> The big line item for Missoula, Mon uh, Monday's council was the uh, Lower Mill Creek speed limit reduction, which frankly isn't the biggest thing, so I'll spare you the clips. And so they approved it to uh, create the 25-mile zone in the Lower Mill Creek area. Um, housing and development, they're going to cover the future of Johnson Street Homeless Shelter, which addresses some of the issues that are happening in the neighborhoods and a lot of folks in the neighborhoods who want to guarantee that this site will not be permanent and be redeve redeveloped for realistic plans for the area. Dan Carlino, City Council, asks a little bit more details about this. Um, I'm going to have to find the real clip, so you're going to have to bear with me for a couple beats of silence. Okay, here is... Uh, Daniel Carlino. If Daniel, stand up. Um, go ahead. Um, yeah, overall, I think this is a good idea to redevelop the site long term and stick to the original plan that the city's doing. Um, however, this is the first year that we've had a, you know, city, you know, city funded full full time year round shelter. Um, and I can't imagine what it's going to be like getting rid of this asset without replacing it. Um, and I know that we have, you know, directed staff to look at long-term solutions, but we need to we need to have it on writing that we're going to open up a new shelter before we demolish this current community asset, in my opinion. So I move to amend the proposal to add a uh, therefore clause, um, be it further resolved, the city of Missoula commits to choosing at least one new suitable site for shelter to replace the community need that the Johnson Street shelter fills before demolition of the Johnson Street shelter starts. All right, so that was um, Dan Colino saying that they should add an amendment saying that even if they do end up demolishing and get rid of it, there should be, uh, it's, it's, 
essentially easier to develop the place more than the people in need of space. So the amendment was added to ensure that the shelter set uh, in place when Johnson shelter is vacated and demolished for redevelopment. Mike Nugent, City Council, is not on board for this, and he explains a little bit further why. Not in favor of the amendment either. I understand, Daniel, what you are uh, getting at. I think that um, we have talked about this significantly over the last several months um, on council, and we've given directive on, on long-term solutions. Th this has been changed to a goal to answer that concern that several council members had of if we don't have something else to do here. Um, so I think we're trying to get too down in the weeds. Um, and I think that everybody around this, this horseshoe is taking this seriously and is not just going to stand by and not have solutions and let something go away. Um, so I just don't feel this is necessary. All right, so that was Mike Nugent's response to the amendment. And of course, unfortunately, the amendment didn't pass. Um, uh, so far, 10% of TIF funding projects goes back into the affordable housing trust fund and voted more energy to providing cheaper housing options for the city of Missoula. Dale Bickle, chief administrative officer for the city of Missoula, talks about how vulnerable the trust fund essentially is and um, expanding it wouldn't do much help for uh, the long term. You know, how I think of the trust fund is not necessarily just this pot of money, but it's the basket of tools we bring to um, affordable housing projects across the city, whether it, you know, whether it includes the general fund allocation or it's the MRA housing policy or any of the other partnerships we can gain through our utilities or anything else. So that's, but having, but having that base funding helps support the staffing and just the administration of all of that. So that's, that's where I believe that 100,000 initially came from. Now, um, council could change priorities and increase that, and that is, but, um, but it's, you know, it's, there's only two places it comes from. It's, you know, additional, uh, you know, additional tax revenues, or it's uh, change the priorities and cuts in another program. All right. So, uh, for the most part, a lot of the money that goes into the Rural House Trust Fund is that um, money generated from TIF, and on top of that, any money that uh, city acquires from selling property in the future as well. In many ways, this fund isn't something that is hard set in the revenue of uh, Missoula generated through TIF and other renewable district type thing of funding. Trust fund seems to be more like money uh, than money that is hard line for the budget every year. So uh, Gwen Jones, City uh, Council, talks a little bit more about the uh, trust fund in general and uh, reacts to this amendment as well. Oh. I guess I lost it, so let me see if I can find it again. Possible in a super challenging environment in which we don't have enough resources, as staff already referred to that. Um, but I'm also highly aware of the incredible tensions and constraints on our general fund, and there are many components of our local government that we can only fund from our general fund. So when we have something like the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, it behooves all of us to find funding outside of the general fund, but also, frankly, we're just going to get a lot more outside of the general fund. So I, I am very hesitant and I'm going to vote against this because I don't want to tie up our general fund when we already have departments that are solely funded by general fund and frankly um, non-negotiable areas like municipal court where it is exclusively general fund funding um, so I don't want to I don't want to put more pressure on the general fund um, and I think between as we've had ARPA dollars um, our federal dollars that was a huge boost to our affordable housing trust fund but also um, the sale of land through MRA, but then the new tool through MRA where with any project that's not doing an affordable housing component, 10% um, will go back into 10% of the MRA uh, portion of that project will go back into the affordable housing trust fund. That is a game changer. So I. All right. So that would. Uh that's one of the uh, many uh, ways that the city is trying to generate some revenue for the Affordable House Trust Fund. And suffice to say, uh, th those motions did not pass through the committee and the Affordable Housing Trust Fund will be at the minimum of $100,000 uh, with the original uh, budgeted for it, not necessarily budgeted through the general fund. Essentially, um, <clears throat> the budget uh, has increased funding, um, higher pay for you know police, fire, a lot of uh, just costs of um, of living, uh, everything just kind of went up, more expensive cost of uh, 
you know, roads, road district, and all that kind of stuff. So essentially the raising of taxes isn't to uh, create more opportunities, but to continue the services that are already in place, which is what is happening right now. So Christian Jordan comes back to talk about those 12 location outdoor shelters as a rotation, so a solution to have designated campsites without the needing the need to move people from parks to parks, telling people to leave. The main point was to use the city property to create space for folks to go to when there's no other place to go. In a way, it gives the city and residents the means to point people in the direction of services beyond the Palvarello can handle. Um, the Palvarello Center, the homeless shelter here in Missoula. Uh, Brian Sudbury, the uh, city attorney, addresses the issue with moving from um, illegal encampments, and this is what he had to say about that. Hold on. Um, Missoula Public Health Department that if we identify a campground, they are going to say it needs to be licensed as a campground under the state regulations. You know, I'd love to find a way around that to say it's not a campground. It's sort of like a place where we're not um, we're not ticketing people. We're not enforcing a prohibition on camping or something like that. And, and if council directed us to do that, uh, we would set up a system like that. But it, it, it's pretty clear that the county is going to view those, or the, the public health department is going to view those as campgrounds. So. We're in a bit of a catch-22 here by saying, uh, if we identify a place, we say you need to go, or you, you're allowed to go to this park or this right away, and several people go there, uh, having the public health department come and say, okay, well, you've, as a government, have directed people to camp here. Where's your uh, running water and sewer connection and, and trash facilities, and where's your campground license? So, you know, it, at the moment, what we're trying to do is keep site-specific areas clean and safe for, for the people that are there, too, just as much as the general public. So, All right, so going back into the old argument of, like, it's too much of a liability for the city to establish a, a camping, designated camping area without providing some sort of services, staffs, uh, uh, waste management, all that kind of stuff. And so uh, TOSS, TSOS, which is the Temporary Safe Outdoor Space, which was created uh, back for the purpose of the uh, 2020 um, pandemic and everything like that. Um, and so, uh, and it was mitigating camping under the Reserve Street Bridge before they put up that by giant fence to deter people from going down there. And staff services provided up to 18 to $20,000 a month to operate this site. Um, Eric Lightgold talks about the Temporary Safe Outdoor Space that was opened near Walmart during during the pandemic and has since moved to the Mullen Road area. So uh, here is what he had to say about this. Hurdles are staffing 24 seven right now. It is a significant uh, cost budget line, um, but we see the impacts from having that because it is building relationships that are providing safe, secure environments for mobility upwards and to sustainable housing. That is the critical component. It also is providing um, a, a secure location where people feel safe um, and has now the utilities that are necessary to have everyday needs met where you can get uh, access to internet, um, uh, uh, hygiene, and, and other day-to-day uh, -day needs. All right, so that is the operation of the um temporary safe outdoor space that's actually off Mullen Road behind those uh, new apartments that just built up. It's basically by the uh, um, Montana, de de uh, the Missoula Detention Center. Uh, 140 people are on the waiting list just for this particular site and it helps uh, 40 to 50 individuals at any given time. And the cost for this, $800,000 that covers the salary of people on the ground, not to mention all the services and 24 hour stuff uh, for folks moving forward. So Christian Jordan uh, Council talks about the uh, consistent contract with homeless folks and a little bit further into that as well. Homeless camps a lot in the last couple weeks um, relative to, or as it relates to this um, referral. Been to camp sweeps. Um, and it really feels to me that we could be doing something differently that will still maintain the safety of our housed and unhoused neighbors, that will reduce the environmental harm that the campsites are causing currently, and that will allow us to keep better tabs on what's happening 
with our urban campers um, because as it stands right now, we are unable to keep tabs on them at all. And so I am really open to any conversation. I, I kind of asked for my pie in the sky wish in this referral, kind of knowing that it would be really hard um, in hopes that we'd find, find some place to meet in the middle. All right. And unfortunately, the uh, the bad news was is that this didn't was completely and utterly unfeasible on the aspect of both liability, lack of funding. Um, you know, it kind of goes back to the idea that, you know, a lot of Missoulians um, <clears throat> were prompted a uh, last election cycle to be like, hey, you know, do you want to donate, get X amount of money to go towards uh, um mobile crisis services uh, lumped up with uh, homeless services to uh, provide those kind of uh, salary people to kind of take care of and uh, mitigate some of the homelessness as well. That didn't happen. And then after the winter street shelter closed, bada bing, bada boom, we had all these people parking, uh, basically setting up camps in parks and people were very uncomfortable with having people there as well. Some horror stories from a couple other comments from people as well and other things that kind of lumped up together with the city putting in that emergency uh, levy, which would create a year long uh, housing um, shelter through the Johnson Street Shelter, which will be opening sometime soon. I'm not exactly sure when they actually opened or not. That I, I haven't been told or haven't learned any information about that specifically. So the main goal is to have a public space for these folks to uh, be without being kicked out down to its core. But as far too many system services are unable to get and have constant contact with folks in general and unfortunately the city cannot take this liability with creating a space which in turn would create the liability so it, it like you know ryan said's very said at the beginning of his comments it is a true catch-22 you know it's it kind of feels like uh helping people is illegal in some of these cases so we're going to dive into uh things that are happening and a lot of investments that are going towards, you know, uh, redevelopment and all that kind of stuff. Public Works dives into the East Missoula Corridor as a major project is looking to improve travel between Missoula and East Missoula communities in the form of alternative travel and the railroad underpass that narrows, which Missoula plans to address. Uh, Deborah Postma gives the presentation and what you can expect to see um, during this presentation as well. So what you see here is a concept of the East Missoula streets, streetscape reconstruction. Um, so again, this is just a concept, but elements include a raised cycle track, landscape boulevard, sidewalks, and street lighting, um, which will just really improve the safety and also the main street of East Missoula. What you see here is what, so this is Highton Street, Highway 200. This is in East Missoula. So this shows what an intersection crossing might look like with the, reconstru the streetscape reconstruction. Um, so we have some just more highlighted bicycle and pedestrian crossings here. And they're integrated pretty well into the race cycle track oh, here. This slide shows um, the Montana Rail Link bridge replacement. So as we know right now, there is a very narrow bridge for people walking or biking under the bridge. Um, so this would widen that for people not in cars. <laughs> All right, so as you can see in this rendering is that essentially they're gonna change the really narrow two-way, basically car only, um, underpass on the rear link to expand a little bit further. Kind of has like a uh, uh, an interesting kind of a, uh, I want to say like a Greeno Park kind of underpass kind of looking thing. If I'm if I were to take it just from just looking at the rendering, of course the last image was looking towards East Missoula from the other side of the underpass, which is already pretty narrow. Now the project is something coming out of the federal Build Back Better plan in the form of many billions in money that is allocated for these grants related to these transformative projects. The cost uh, without the federal funding is uh, roughly 26 to 31 million dollars and uh, with this grant it's going to be an 80-20 split for local uh, to federal, um, well federal to local, 80 for federal, 24 local 
just to clarify, Montana Department of Transportation, well, Montana Department of Transportation, the state will cover most of the local costs. So you cannot forget about the state money. It's not always just the city, county of Missoula that are paying for it. Uh, Deborah gives an example on how uh, Montana Department of Transportation would pitch in to cover a majority of the 20% uh, matching grant towards this as well. So this is what um, Deb is going to say a little bit more about this. MDT is providing approximately $4 million. Um, if we ask for the lower end of the 26 to 31 million estimate that I said earlier, um, then with the city and county, we anticipate needing to provide under a million between the two of us. Um, but again, uh, we would have a specific number and have to come back to city council to you all um, with that ask for the match, but. All right, so right now it's still kind of up in the air. This is a proposal and this is a pretty big deal if they're gonna be able to do this and overall the local fund would total $5.2 million to uh, $6.2 million, which is, as she said, MDT would help cover the majority. Uh, the end of this uh, su city support of this proposal to present for the grant. So essentially this isn't the city approving this project, but the uh, the motion to basically be like, all right, let's send this and see if we can get some grant for this as well. And so this will most likely be a part of the, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, will be a part of the uh, uh, Monday or maybe next Monday's night's um, consent agenda in which they will approve to move forward on this as well. So there's a lot of projects in place. You know, it seems to be kind of stacking up. Um, you can find out more by going on to the City of Missoula's website, ca.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful website where you can find out what's going on, uh, current uh, past meetings, not to mention going to engagemissoula.com, which talks about current and upcoming projects and also past projects. And, and you can do a Q&A and ask some questions about these projects, how much it's going to cost, how much uh, the taxpayer is going to have to pay, those kind of things. And most of the time, you'll probably get a response very similar to the idea that it's already been allocated with a lot of the funding through MRA funding through uh, other means and also uh, public private financing because there's a lot of people who have who would benefit from the expansion of all these different corridors that are going to be improved not to mention all that money that's going towards the uh, downtown improvement of essentially from Bear Track Bridge to uh, where Higgins breaks off into Brook Street. They're trying to make that into single lanes. Some people are upset about it because it's going to uh, take some parking away and a lot of business owners downtown are very kind of frustrated with how much the city is doing with that. But I don't want to get too much into that just because there's a lot of things happening in the city and uh, roughly the county of Missoula and there's a lot of opportunity to really tap into these federal dollars and most of these federal dollars only uh, get uh, approved if there is a uh, end matching um, um, contribution from local entities as well. So you have a higher chance of getting federal approval that way. So we're going to actually jump right into some of your events as well. We have a little bit of time. We're going to talk a little bit more about what's happening. As always, if you're interested in doing some indoor fun, MISMO Gymnastics Roots Acro Sports Center and YMCA are the many locations in the Missoula area for some indoor fun. As we're getting a little bit colder and you know there's not much uh, opportunities for uh, outdoor recreation as we're getting um, into the cooler temperatures, those are some of the locations uh, for exercise and recreation as the weather begins to cool down. Tiny Tales and Story Time around 10.30 a.m. most uh, Fridays with uh, Story Time happening every Saturday at 10.30 as well. A begin beginning reading in a group setting to encourage the fun of reading for kids who are under the age of six. Lunch at the Missoula Senior Center as a recurring event at the Missoula Senior Center. Yarns at the Missoula Public Library on the fourth floor stitch, crochet, and all that kind of stuff. Watercolor will be coming back sometime soon. Um, just check out for that. Look at the library events on Missoula, uh, MissoulaPublicLibrary.com. Welcoming week story time. So the Missoula Public Library is doing a special uh, noon o'clock story time on the second floor of the Public Library. You will find a welcoming library. A young uh, special edition of Tiny Tales will take place on Friday and Saturday of welcoming week, inviting young children and their families to listen to, uh, to titles from the welcoming library and participate in a craft that highlights the value of inclusivity for kids. Lego Club is also happening. It's a recurring event every Friday at 2.30 p.m. Uh, Fayette, uh, Montana Irish Festival, I totally butchered that, is at Karis Park uh, this afternoon at 3 p.m., a free immersive event that celebrates Irish music, sports, and culture, and it's not even March. 
uh, sketching in Missoula, Z uh, Zootown Arts Community Center, <laughs> starting at 5.30 p.m. to about uh, 7.30 p.m. It's uh, a lesson, sketch the flavors of Missoula in this area right around the Zootown Arts Community Center. This historic lo uh, locality offers much to capture in the event of sketch artists. Uh, be aware that this is, uh, a, this is a two hour class and it is $125. Uh, night Blooming Jasmine, Bluegrass at Imagination Brewing Company, live music at uh, Cranky Sand Public House, jazz music. Um, you got a jam playing at the Wilma Theater. It is an evening with Umphreys McGee. Uh, jazz is going to also be at the Old Post. A lot of jazz happening Friday night. You like jazz? Um, Kimberly Carlson uh, Trio is going to be at the Old Post um, starting at 8 p.m. Copy Mountain Band is going to be the Sunrise Soon playing some country music at 9 p.m. if you want to break from jazz. Um, Saturday, as always, we have our markets and such going well into the end of October. You guys can check that out. It's roughly from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the downtown Missoula area. You can't miss it. It's by a carousel for Missoula. Also at the Red X's and Pine Street in front of the Thomas Marr Bar. Uh, the 19th annual Spontaneous Construction is happening at 9 a.m. on Saturday, designated to inspire culture of reuse with a free engaging community activity. Spontaneous Construction, or SpontCon for short, has been a annual Missoula tradition. This is their 19th annual one contest. Uh, con um, Contest participants have several hours to use their choice of home resource material to be the most beautiful, functional, and creative pieces they can dream up. And these pieces will be on display for uh, first Friday in October here at the Missoula Public Library. And many of these things that were built will be uh, transported here through the end of September. So you guys can check out what's that? It was made during spontaneous construction, if you're wondering. Batman Day at Muse Comics starting at 10 a.m. Celebrate the iconic superhero with 20% off. Batman Graphics. Uh, Universe Montana is doing their uh, Arbor, uh, Arbor Tours, and it's another word for basically you'll get a look at trees and such. And so you get a look at the trees and their history of the Universe Montana, and you can meet near Main Hall um, near their greenhouse area. So you, you really can't miss it. It's kind of like between Main Hall and a little bit uh, to the corner of the University Center. And then, if that's starting at 11 a.m. if you're interested in looking at some of the trees in the Missoula, University of Missoula area, uh, University of Montana, sorry. Um, MCAT Saturday drop-in is a recurring event in our studio space in here. These kids get a chance to uh, do some stop animation, make movies, and more. This happens from 1 to 3 p.m. It is a creative workshop for kids to drop in at any time. Natural History Center is also doing a fall foliage, at the Saturday's uh, kids activity, part of their ongoing event that happens at 1 p.m. on Saturdays in conjunction with our Saturday drop-ins. But you get to learn things. Uh, for MCAT, it's more just like you get to create things. Um, and then also, uh, one of the big things that are happening here at the Missoula Public Library is the NEA 2023 Big Read, Frank Little, father of the Western Free Speech Fight, Missoula Public Library, Jane Little uh, Botkin, author of the award-winning uh, biography, Frank Little, and the IWW, The Blood That Stained the American Family. IWW was one of the first uh, organi organized unions that was met with violence and all sorts of different things during the times of, of uh, the 1890s to the 1920s. Free speech fight held in Missoula, uh, sa September 28th in conjunction, uh, 1909 through October 8th, 1909. Frank Little is the author of The Great Granduncle, went, went to uh, the perfect free speech fights throughout the West before being murdered for his words in Butte, Montana on August 1st, 1917. The NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. And also, if you're interested in do, checking out some of the local sponsored sports, Hellgate Roller Derby is versing the Copper City Queens at Missoula City Fairgrounds 3 p.m. on Saturday. This is the Catch Hell Roller, Roller Girls, and this is going to be at the Missoula County Fairgrounds, uh, the 4-H Pavilion. Uh, tickets are $10 at the door, and this is a kind of like a full content mixer. You can meet up with them, and so the bout is at 6 p.m. Um, speaking of 6 p.m., Imagination Brewing Company is having a folk music with uh, Three Dog Mike and One Dog Holly. Vibe is going to be on top of the uh, VRTX rooftop, Missoula's High Frequency Dance Party, uh, starting at 7 p.m. Blue Mountain Observity, uh, of, uh, Observatory Viewings. Um, if you like a stargazer and you're interested in that kind of stuff, Blue Mountain Ad Observatory Viewings. It's $25 per ticket, but they are only limited to 25 people. It's super limited availability nights, and it starts at LED. 8.30 p.m. Saturday night, and then you got some karaoke at Westside Lanes at 9 p.m. on Saturday night. Also, you have electronic music at Monk's Music at 9 p.m. called The Drip. Um, 
Chris Moon is going to be at the Badlander to wrap things up. And then um, before we kind of wrap up for the morning show, I want to talk about some Sunday stuff. If you're interested in trains and stuff, CS Porter Middle School from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is doing uh, talking all about trains and model trains in a, in a swap meet as well. Uh, Stories and Stones, um, they're going to they're happening uh, for the first time in three years. This is uh, basically uh, reading the stories and having uh, mini biographies of the dead people who have graced Missoula over the years, starting at noon on Sunday. And then, of course, we got the... Uh, the String Orchestra of the Rockies concert series starting at 4 p.m. at the University of Montana Recital Hall. And if you're Jewish, they're doing a shofar in the park at the Karis Park uh, Pavilion starting at 5.30 p.m. An express meaningful high holiday experience, the Rosh Hashanah Family Fun. And they'll be at Karis Park starting at 5.30 p.m. with do-it-yourself cupcakes and all sorts of ceremonies overlooking the Brennan's Waves and more. So. That's what's basically going on. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ranf. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend.